And then uh, I will go ahead with uh, the National Reference Center, what we do, uh, and how we analyze all these data uh, with bioinformatics methods. So the three viruses uh, we are mainly interested in are SARS-CoV-2. You know it uh, quite well, I think. Uh, it's a coronavirus. Um, it's been the cause of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the first sequences that have been deposited in the public database uh, databases uh, were, were in late uh, 2019. It's a positive single-stranded RNA virus. It means that its genome is composed of one RNA molecule, about uh, 30,000 nucleotides. And the genome is uh, like that. So we have several genes, uh, let's say of 1A, of 1B, the S gene, known because it encodes the spike protein, uh, which we, we monitor a lot for the mutations in this protein because it helps the virus uh, go into the cell. Um, from the beginning of the, of the pandemic, uh, there were about 800 million cases that were reported. If you look at the WHO data from May 2024, it's quite a large number. Um, then influenza virus, it's a negative strand RNA virus, um, but instead of one segment, one molecule of RNA, there are eight molecules of RNA, about for a total of 15,000 nucleotides. There are four ma main genera that infect the vertebrates, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And they are famous for several epidemics, such as the Spanish flu, swine flu, Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, drug flu. So, so uh, flu is quite uh, famous, and uh, many, many of you have been infected by flu at some point, I guess. Um, and the last one I will present briefly, uh, respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, it causes the bronchiolitis, and which is a very serious condition, especially in newborns, uh, hospital, especially the, the newborns that, are, that may be hospitalized for that. Uh, the number of cases per year is about 33 million worldwide and uh, 450,000 cases uh, in France every year. Uh, yeah, each genome is one segment of about 15,000. Okay, and so globally, um, the thing with these viruses is that they evolve uh, over time. So they accumulate mutations. Let's say we have a parental uh, genome. I don't know if I'm afraid that it, will, it won't work if I try to. Okay. So we have a parental genome here. It will accumulate mutations. So let's say that this T will be uh, mutated to an A and this uh, G, for example, to a C. At the, in the end, this virus will, will have two new mutations, A and C, compared to the parental sequence. These mutations can be of different types. You can have deleterious mutations, uh, neutral mutations, and advantageous mutations that can increase, for example, the fitness of the virus, the, the pathogenicity, the transmissibility, uh, the resistance to some treatments. Um, and so, in the end, uh, the virus is subjected to many selective pressures uh, due to immune system, treatment, environment, host, host environment. And uh, this uh, virus can adapt. Uh, with uh, mutations. And by doing so, uh, accumulating mutations, uh, the, these viruses will evolve, and we can represent this evolution using phylogenetic trees. So this tree was published in 2020 in uh, Nature and Microbiology by the team of Hombo. And um, so it represents the, the evolution of the virus at the beginning of the pandemic. It was published in 2020. And what we can see with that, uh, with that tree is that a lot of viruses are very close to each other. There are very few mutation parts. And uh, we can use these grouping sequences in the phylogenetic tree to, um, to define a nomenclature, a naming scheme. So what's, that's what they did. They call this nomenclature Pongo, Pongo lineages. And these lineages we find are, they are hierarchical. It means that one big clade here, here is called B, and there is a subclade called B.1 and so on. It's a rather complex nomenclature. There are maybe thousands of names today. Uh, but the, 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 the advantages of that is that it allows us to follow the evolution of the prevalence of the different kind of viruses uh, over time. For example, here in January 2023, the BA.5 lineage defined in this nomenclature was quite prevalent here. And over the year, this prevalence decreased until reaching almost zero here. And it was replaced by other lineages, such as the XBB and the, its uh, child, child, child uh, lineage. So this nomenclature allowed us, and so based on the phylogenetic evolution, phylogenetic trees, allowed us to uh, follow the different lineages over time. 
And actually, these lineages correspond also to some mutational patterns because each lineage is defined by a combination of different mutations. Um, okay for that. In the National Reference Center for Respiratory Viruses, uh, headed by Marianne Ramexenti, uh, we are focusing mainly, as I said, on SARS-CoV-2 viruses, uh, respiratory syncytial virus, and influenza viruses. The missions are manifold, and among them, um, the, 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 the goal is to sample, to take samples from patients, test them for, um, for different viruses, a lot of viruses, respiratory viruses, and for the positive samples, we sequence them and we analyze the data in order to uh, perform a, a epidemiological surveillance. In the end, to uh, alert the health authorities, such as uh, Santé Publique France, the public health organization. And we are mainly uh, focusing on, uh, for example, sensitivity to antivirals. We try to see if there are new mutations that appear uh, that could be problematic. The global pipeline is this one. So sampling, uh, testing the samples for different kinds of viruses. The positive samples are sequenced. And then we have raw data going out from the sequencers that we analyze uh, using bioinformatics data analysis tools. And then these sequences here are compared to public data sets in order to perform some more complex data, um, cooperative analysis and evolutionary analysis that I will talk about. Um, more globally, worldwide, uh, the different reference laboratories uh, are generally parts of huge networks. Uh, this network is called COVINET for COVID uh, Coronavirus Network. And it allows other labs to share their data and their epidemiological surveillance in, in order to have a more broader uh, understanding of the pandemics. Okay, so all these labs are uh, generating data sets, generating sequences of viruses and so on, and they are depositing. Uh, all these data on public databases, such as this one, GZ, that is one of the reference data sources for these three viruses, uh, um, influenza, COVID, and RSV. To have a, a, a rough idea of the, the size of these uh, data sets, for uh, influenza, we have about 2.5 million sequences in the, this uh, database. For SARS-CoV-2, about 16 million. And uh, all these data sets come along with uh, other metadata that inform us uh, about the, the provenance of the different samples, where they come from, when they have been sampled, and so on. So it allows to do a lot of analysis afterwards, downstream, uh, such as datation, when a new lineage emerged, uh, for example, uh, a phylogeography, where the, did it emerge, and phylogenomics, uh, which means uh, characterizing the epidemics using molecular data. So that's the evolution of the number of sequences in SARS-CoV-2 SARS sequencing with the GZ in, uh, from uh, the beginning of the pandemic to, to 2024. It was quite sharp here, now a little bit uh, less, but, uh, but still we, we, we continue to sequence a lot of these viruses. Um, okay. Then, uh, now that we know a little bit where the, the data come from, I will uh, present how these data are produced concretely, how we analyze them, and how can we uh, can we interpret these data once uh, we generated all these sequences. So we have the samplings, the, the sequencing, raw data analysis, and what we, do, we can do with that. I will start very briefly on one slide with the sequencing for those who don't know really this uh, this uh, method. Um, so we start from a sample in which we have uh, several viruses. Let's say we have a positive sample for, for SARS-CoV-2. We'll start by amplifying the SARS-CoV-2 genome using amplicon-based sequencing. And these amplified fragments are then sequences, sequenced. And uh, at the output, the output of the sequencer, we have these kind of files with millions of little sequences called reads of about uh, between 100 and 200 uh, nucleotides. And each of these sequences comes from um, a, a particular region location in the in the original region, the reference genome. Here, as the reference genome, we use the one of the first sequences that were deposited in the database. So for an example, I don't know if it's really clear here, but we have the, the full genome here of the SARS-CoV-2. And for each uh, little uh, each little square here corresponds to one sequence that has been sequenced, uh, one read that is uh, placed at the right location on the, on the genome. And on the top here, we have the coverage, meaning the number of reads that map to the specific region. And what we, if, you, if we zoom, for example, on this region, we can see the different reads 
that are placed on the right position. And directly, what we can see is that here on, the, on this position, we have a C on the reference genome. But on all the reads, here we have a T. It means that there is a mutation at this position, T instead of C. And here, we have all the reads that are, that are deleted for the, the nine nucleotides. I, um, however, in the reference genome, we have the nine nucleotides. So that way, we can know uh, what are all the mutations that are present in the, in the, the sample. And that's what the plan I will show now uh, exactly does. This pipeline uh, analyzes uh, exactly the, the what I just presented. So the data I will put from the sequencer, and they go through many steps, many processes, and so on. And this pipeline has been developed collabor collaboratively and iteratively by many people from the hub of bioinformatics at the beginning. Uh, the team of Etienne Simon Laurier, uh, Georges Marchmont, who, uh, who helped a lot refactoring the pipeline. Uh, and now the pipeline is maintained by Kevin Da Silva, Sa Samar Berra, and, and uh, Jérôme Bourré, uh, who are bioinformaticians in uh, the National Reference Center. So there are different processes, but the main part is the part on the top. It takes the reads as input and it generates uh, the full genomes of uh, the full genome of the, the, the viruses of all the samples. We have other processes that correspond to quality control and so on, and also the, the annotation. So each uh, sequence, we want to know uh, what is its uh, lineage. So for this part, basically what we do is take the initial read uh, file. We assemble all the reads, meaning that we want to create a longer sequences. Roughly, it means that if there is an intersection between two reads, we can merge them to longer sequences. But there are some uh, very nice algorithmic uh, developments in that area, in that domain. I'm not expert in, but still it's very interesting. And then uh, we use this assembly in order to modify the reference genome, the initial one, in order to get a reference genome that is closer to the sample. And this reference genome is then, is then used to remap the reads on it and to see where is where are the mutations and so on. So it's called a variant calling and consensus calling. In the end, we have consensus genome that corresponds to the main, for each position of the reference genome, we have the, the main nucleotide, the, the, the nucleotide that has the, 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 the most coverage, let's say. So that's a description of the pipeline. In the end, we have a lot of consensus sequences, uh, FASTA sequences and clade annotation, and the quality control reports and so on. It's important to know that these sequences are not directly deposited in the public databases because uh, there may be some errors when you uh, when you analyze, uh, I don't know, thousands of sequences uh, per month. There may be some mutations that are wrongly called, not because there are thresholds, you know, at each step to, to be sure that it's a mutation and so on. So there is a manual curation of each sequence to be sure that we do not deposit on public databases uh, some wrong uh, mutations that could create some alerts uh, to the World Health Organization and kind of things. Um, so in the end, uh, in public databases, more and more sequences, it becomes difficult to extract information from this data, and uh, we had to develop tools able to scale up to this huge uh, amount of data. And that's how, uh, that's what I will talk now uh, about uh, how uh, we uh, analyze these sequences using public data and to perform a comparative analysis. It's possible to do many things uh, with this data. As I said before, we want to trace the evolution of the virus. And to do so, we will use phylogenetic methods. We want to monitor the emergence of uh, new variants, new lineages, new mutations. We want to characterize the epidemics in terms of uh, growing or not or decreasing the global epidemics using molecular data, and we want to trace, to trace the geographical evolution of the virus using datation methods, phylogeographical methods. But to do so, we need there are different steps. The first one is that we want to align the sequences uh, together. I will talk a little bit about that. We want to infer phylogenies. I will talk a little bit about that, about that also, how to infer trees and to test their robustness. And we want to perform evolutionary analysis. And I will present a, a project we worked on this uh, topic. Also. Why do we need to align this, uh, all these sequences? Um, the, when, we, when we generate the consensus sequences, there may be some insertions, deletions, and so they are not aligned anymore. If we just uh, put them on top of each other, we obtain something like that. 
they are not aligned. Uh, we don't know if this uh, G or this C corresponds to this C and so on. So we want to be sure that all the columns and the alignment are homologous and they correspond to the same position. Okay. And so this multiple sequence alignment is a crucial step in any downstream analysis because, uh, especially with these viruses where there are quite few mutations, if two sequences are just two or three mutations apart, if you uh, shift the alignment, you will have lots of mutations that will just bias uh, the, the evolutionary analysis downstream. So this um, multiple sequence alignment problem is really crucial for downstream analysis. However, the usual tools that we use for, uh, for building this multiple sequence analysis, multiple sequence alignment, uh, are, have difficulties with more than a few hundred, a few thousand sequences. It's because of the algorithmic complexity and uh, also because of incomplete low quality sequences, sequencing errors that accumulate when we when in the data. That's why in 2020, we worked on COVID Align. Um, uh, so a, yeah, um, a scalable uh, alignment workflow that was adapted to SARS-CoV-2 sequences. Um, and it was based on a profile HMM uh, using a very high quality sequence data set that we extracted at the beginning of the, the pandemic. We lined them, we created the, the alignment and so on. We estimated uh, HMM profile that uh, actually uh, model uh, how the different transitions between the nucleotides, the, the probability of having a deletion, an insertion, uh, the, the frequency of each nucleotide at its position and so on. This profile HMM was then used uh, to align the sequences independently, one by one, uh, to, uh, to, this, uh, to this profile. It was uh, done with a hammer. And actually it worked quite well. Uh, the the alignments were really accurate. Uh, and the nice thing is that it was also linear in terms of number of sequences. We just could uh, parallelize everything. Uh, it was uh, independent. Each sequence was uh, aligned independently on the profile HMM. So we can scale up that on a huge cluster. It was okay. And it could handle at the time the whole data set. But it was still very memory intensive. And other teams uh, in parallel worked on this alignment uh, tool called Next Align uh, because they observed that actually all sequences that we are analyzing for SARS-CoV-2 are uh, constructed from the same reference. So we all map the reads on the same reference. So it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to just align them globally uh, like that because we know the reference from on which they are being uh, uh, reconstructed. And they are very similar, highly similar to each other. So here, uh, the next align, align all the sequences pairwise, again, the same reference, the initial one, with some algorithmic tricks. For example, they try to find matching seeds between the reference and the, compar the, the compared sequence using some specific data structures. They extend the seeds using a sliding window and reconstruct a band of variable width here that, um, that covers the full alignment. And that way, it's possible with some dynamic programming approach to just uh, constrain our search in this specific area, and it's really efficient. Uh, it's, yeah. And so next line it's uh, nowadays widely used in this domain, and not only for SARS-CoV-2, but uh, for a lot of viruses. Okay, so now we have our sequences, our consensus sequences that are quite clean. We have our global multiple sequence alignment, but we want to infer the evolutionary relationships between these different uh, sequences. So we want to infer phylogenies. And to infer, so yeah, infer evolutionary relationships of a group of individuals by comparing genes and protein sequences. That's the, the point of phylogeny. And here on viruses, usually we take the full genome. So as I said before, for SARS-CoV-2, it's 38,000 nucleotides and the full sequence. And the, here for, for SARS-CoV-2, all the, the analyzed sequences are inherited from common ancestor. We know that it derived from the same reference, from the same original strain. And yeah, for the phylogeny, we need all the sequences to be homologous. And so we want to start from this multiple sequence alignment to get a tree. And this tree here is unrooted. It means that we don't know where is the starting point. Um, for SARS-CoV-2, we can root it afterwards because we know the initial sequence. But let's say that this tree is unrooted. We know we, we want to know the topology, how the different sequences are grouped together and how the different branches are branched together. And we want to infer the branch lengths that correspond Roughly to a number of mutations that separate uh, different claims. But to do so, uh, just briefly, I will introduce 
very roughly um, evolutionary models. It's just that I will use them afterwards on the, on the evolutionary analysis part. So here, basically, we're going to model the sequence evolution in the likelihood framework. And to do so, um, for example, here, if we, if we take this position of the multiple sequence alignment, there is an A, a, a and a C, so T1, T2, T3. We can map them on the tree. And with uh, in the likelihood framework and the model of evolutions, the models of evolution, we can uh, compute the probabilities at internal nodes to have an A, a C, a G, a T, for example. Okay, and this probability is computed using the branch length and the, 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 the shape of the tree. And so we use this modeling to infer the best tree using uh, knowing the data, the alignment. And the best tree is in, in, in the end the, the tree that maximizes the likelihood. So we, we optimize the likelihood uh, and then we will find, yeah, so the tree that maximizes the likelihood. There are several tools that uh, are able to perform that. Uh, I can mention IQ3, FireML, and RaxMLNG, the three main uh, tools for that, the three, the three usual suspects. And um, also, yeah, they take a multiple sequence alignment, they infer a tree. However, with uh, the, 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 the size of the SARS CoV 2 data set, uh, it, it's impossible to use these tools and the, the classical likelihood framework to infer a tree with uh, 16 million sequences is just impossible. And so during the pandemic, some uh, some teams, uh, not us, but some teams, uh, developed these tools, uh, Assure and Map Optimize, for example, because they observed that the trees that we are talking about have very large number of very small branches. So the, the, the different clays are only one mutation apart or two mutations apart and so on. So the trees contain a lot of small branches. Uh, they basically uh, show the evolution of these viruses in almost real time because we sample every time we sample all, all the years all along the year we sample uh, new data set new sequences and so we have sequences from uh, almost all the epidemics and uh, so in that particular case the classical parsimony algorithms work quite well parsimony in that case means that we do not use this probabilistic modeling of uh, model of evolution so the op of uh, evolution of proteins or sequences, but we will use a parsimony that we count, we will count the number of mutations that appear in the tree. And it's really more efficient in that case. And so the, these two tools I, I have been using uh, to, uh, to update the full tree of the pandemic. So the full tree means that we use phylogenetic placement to place new sequences iteratively to update the full tree. On this tree, and then optimize this new tree using some dedicated trees based on parsimony. And so this uh, this circular workflow, iterative workflow, will iteratively update the tree, re-optimize it, and re-update the tree and re-optimize it without having to uh, reconstruct the full tree from scratch each time. Each time. And actually, it works uh, here. We and we can even visual, visualize the tree made of millions of tips using uh, this tool. And um, so yeah, now we have trees that have more than. Uh, yeah, several millions of, of tips using these uh, these tools. It's dedicated to some particular data set. It's not applicable to all kind of data sets, but for these viral data sets, it works well. So now I will ask the question of, um, so we have trees, okay, but we want to assess whether the, these trees are robust, statistically robust in terms of uh, of branches in that yeah, we want to to know if the, the the trees that have been the branches of the trees that have been inferred uh, are they robust statistically relevant and to do so there are different uh, methods but the main the main method that is used is the phylogenetic bootstrap I, i'm talking a little bit of, uh, about that because I've, I've been working on bootstrap uh, for the past few years and so here the the process is the following we start from the multiple sequence alignment we infer the tree with the different tools that i presented before and then we will resample the columns of the multiple sequence alignment with replacement. And we did that way, it will generate one bootstrap alignment. And we do it, let's say, 1,000 times. We have, in that case, 1,000 bootstrap alignments. And from each of these bootstrap alignments, we will infer a bootstrap tree. Okay? And in the end, the support, the statistical support of this branch of the reference tree will, be, will correspond to the um, proportion of bootstrap trees in which we find this exact same branch. Okay? And one branch is defined by a split of the taxa. It means that this branch splits the taxa, the sequence set, in two. We have on one side one, two, on the other side, three, four, five. Okay? 
And we find this split on this tree, but not on this tree. OK, and uh, so that way we call, uh, we compute the FBP, Felsenstein bootstrap proportion, which will, which will correspond to the support we want to compute. However, so yeah, just it's a binary function. It means that the branch is present or absent in each bootstrap tree. However, with the very large data sets, there are, there are some limits of uh, this uh, method. And especially uh, here we tried on the uh, HIV uh, the sequence data set of almost 10,000 uh, sequences. The subtypes are colored uh, in different colors, and we can see that here the bootstrap support of this well-known clays are very low, for example, here at 3%. And it's due to different things such as recombination, convergence, partial sequences. I will talk about convergence in the last part. Uh, partial sequences, uh, reconstruction errors, and so on. And the more taxa we have, the higher the probability of this rogue taxa uh, is, and the rogue taxa are the sequences that are not placed on the same position of the tree on each bootstrap tree. And these taxa, especially for deep branches, uh, make a strong impact, have a strong impact on the support. Um, yeah, so what we did, we worked, what, what we worked on, especially with uh, Mireille, Jean Bacca, and Olivier Gasquel here, was a new version of this bootstrap called TBE, the Transfer Bootstrap Expectation, in which we have the exact same process. We, gen we generate a reference tree, bootstrap trees, and so on. But instead of comparing one branch to the exact branch in each bootstrap tree, we measure, um, we, we define a continu almost continuous function that measures the, the, the degree of presence of the branch in the trees. So it's not anymore 0 or 1, or one but it can be 0.5. And um, just as an example, we define three things. The first one is the distance between two branches. We want to, to, to compute the distance between the branch, one branch of the reference tree, one branch of the bootstrap tree. And here the distance is two means that if we if we uh, consider the splits, one, two, five, three, four, and these splits, if we move five on the other side and three on the other side, so two moves, we have uh, the same split. So it's a distance of two. And then we define the distance between one branch of the reference tree and a full bootstrap tree. This distance is actually the minimum distance that we can find. So we take the, the branch that, uh, that uh, computes the, 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 the minimum distance between the two branches. So it's the minimum. And in the end, we compute the average of all these minimum distances over all the bootstrap trees. We normalize them. And it's called TBE. It has nice properties. And uh, especially uh, if we analyze the same data set, we can see that these branches are not well supported. Um, OK, for the bootstrap. So now we have uh, our multiple sequence alignments. We have our phylogenetic trees. We know how to assess their robustness. And we want uh, to, oh no, there is one last slide, sorry for, for that. It's just that there were some discussions about the, 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 the fact that TBE could be biased towards highly dense, uh, densely sampled uh, clades. If clades have basically a uh, lot of very similar sequences, it may be biased. And uh, with uh, Paul and Olivier, uh, we worked on, the, on this uh, topic. And what uh, Paul did is to subsample a lot of the, um, the, the trees in order to have a more balanced uh, set of clades. And he found out that actually FBP shows a high, high variability, strong increase while subsampling and poor signal in resting trees, rather than TBE that was found to be more robust and stable across all subtypes. So it was uh, better than expected uh, towards subsampling. OK, so now we have our trees. We know how to assess the robustness. And we will uh, compute, uh, we will do some evolutionary analysis on these trees. And I will present a project we, we've been working on with uh, Marie during his PhD and Olivier SQL. This is about convergent evolution. Um, I, I think I forgot to put the, the reference that it used to be. Uh, so it was published this year in uh, GBE. Um, so if we look at the cycle of the HIV in a human cell, we can see that there are several parts of this cycle that are targeted by uh, antiviral treatments. We can think about uh, protease inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Right? And these uh, protease, reverse transcriptase, integrase are proteins that are coded by the virus. And if imagine that we have some mutations in these proteins that prevent the treatment to work. This is called uh, drug resistance mutations. And once uh, the viruses acquire these mutations, uh, the viruses become uh, resistant, 
and they can replicate again in the host organism, and treated patients can transmit again the disease. So these little cartoons were made by uh, Anna Zukova. Um, yeah, so the treated patients can even transmit uh, the disease. If we look at it differently, uh, if we want to look at it through a convergent uh, lens, convergent evolution can be defined as the independent evolution of similar characteristics, similar traits in organisms in different lineages. And actually, our, our DRMs, drug resistance mutations, are also mutations that appear independently on several patients uh, in response to the same uh, antiviral treatment. Okay, so we can see these uh, drug resistant mutations as convergent mutations. If we look at this educational uh, figure, let's say uh, it's uh, so what we can see is that we have a phylogenetic tree. And these, all the samples are viral samples, and here we represent two mutations, mutation one, mutation two. And each sample has, has the mutation or do not have, uh, does not have the mutation. So we have the pattern of mutation uh, for the two mutations and the, the profile of the phenotype. Here we have the samples that have the, the given phenotype, let's say uh, resistant to the treatment, and the other ones do not have this phenotype, so they are, they are not resistant to the treatment. And what we want to do is to extract the mutations that are correlated with the phenotype. We want to extract the, the, the mutations that are that that, that are very co highly correlated with uh, the resistant uh, patients or the resistant viruses. Uh, this phenotype can be also uh, so it's treatment, but it can be a uh, adaptation. So, however, in the data sets, usually you don't have the perfect correlation, so it's more complicated than that. We have some sequences that do not have uh, the phenotype and that uh, do not have the mutations and that, are, that have the phenotype. We can have also the, uh, the reverse thing where you have the mutation but not the phenotype. So, so the, 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 the data set is more noisy uh, than uh, presented before. And um, so what we want to do is to, uh, so we asked a question, can we detect signatures of viral evolution and convergent evolution at the genomic level? With such noisy phenotypes, and or even sometimes without the phenotype. To do so, uh, Marie, during her PhD, developed this uh, tool, Condor, for convergent evolution, uh, con convergent detector. It's made of uh, two components. The first one is emergence, and the second one is uh, correlation. So I will present briefly this, uh, these two components. The, the emergence uh, component tries to compare simulated mutations with observed mutation in the data set. And I will present what, what does it mean exactly. So here we have the, muta the mutation, the multiple sequence alignment here, the phylogenetic tree. So that's why I presented all of them before. Uh, we map, let's say we, we are just interested in this position of the multiple sequence alignment, okay? The position that is interesting in the some protein of the virus. We have uh, the two, three, four, and five that have the mutation, they are red, and the other ones, do not have the mutation. We can map this state of characters on the tree. And then using the same model of evolution I presented before, the evolutionary rates, the branch lengths of the tree, we are able to infer, to reconstruct ancestral states at each internal node of the tree. For example, here we had uh, the mutation here, the mutation here. The most likely explanation is that they were, there, there, there was this mutation here also. Okay, and if we look at the global tree, maybe this one is the most likely explanation that we do not have, the, we did not have the mutation here at this internal. And using this reconstructed scenario, we can count the number of times the, the mutation appeared in the tree. So here it's the observed number of emergencies of these mutations. Okay, we have this uh, observed number. And then we compare that with a new hypothesis, what we could expect by chance. And to do so, we took, we take this, uh, ancestral uh, state at the root of the phylogeny that we inferred, and we go the other way around. So we start from this root sequence, this root uh, state, we place it on the tree, and we will simulate a number of times, let's say 10,000 times, the evolution of these states, this character along the tree. So that's one simulation over the 10,000. And we'll have uh, this scenario, for example, that uh, just been simulated, where there is no mutation here, no mutation here, no mutation here, but one mutation here. And then the same, the same thing here, no mutation here, one mutation here. So here we can count the number of mutations that appear in the tree on simulations given the model of evolution that we chose. And 
sorry, and since we did 10,000 nuclear, uh, nuclear tests, 10,000 simulations, uh, we have a distribution of these expected numbers. And we can compare what we observe in the data sets with this distribution to compute p-values uh, p values, and so uh, at least the mutations that are that emerge more often than expected by chance. The second component of uh, the workflow is to so yeah just to be sure uh, to to be clear uh, this component does not take at all the phenotype so we don't know for each sequence if it's uh, resistant or not it's just without a priori on the phenotype. In the second component, we uh, we use the phenotype and we try to correlate the presence absence of the mutations with the convergent, the convergent phenotype. To do so, we use a tool called, bi called uh, bias traits, and we use two traits. The first one is the presence absence of a given mutation, and the second trait is the presence absence absence of the phenotype. And the on the tree, we can map the two. On, the, on all the tips, and we want to correlate uh, both of these traits. We define two models in bias traits using, uh, so it uses Bayesian um, mutation. We use two models. The first one is the independent model. The two traits are considered independent. They evolve independently in the tree. And in the second model, they evolve dependently. So the, the, their evolution is correlated in the trees. They evolve together. And so using Bayesian computation, we are able to compute marginal likelihood of the two models, the dependent or the independent model, and so in the end, compute a log a bias factor that will inform us on the strength of the correlation between the two traits. The more, uh, the higher the log bias factor, the, 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 the strongest the correlation is. Uh, and the correlation can be positive or negative. And so we use this, uh, this bias factor to, uh, to compare uh, these uh, strengths of correlation between the two traits with the list of mutations that has been um, uh, known to be a, uh, to appear more often than expected. So we group all, all of these together. We tested this tool uh, on, uh, on this data set from a drug resistance mutations in West and Central Africa, composed of, of about 2,000 sequences. And we used that the phenotype, the fact that the samples were treated or not treated as the proxy to resistant or not resistant. And that's why we needed a pipeline that is able to, uh, to support fuzzy or noisy phenotypes because uh, we have non-treated patients that have uh, resistant mutations, treated patients that do not have the resistant mutations. So it's, uh, yeah, and we use that like that. And actually um, we are were able, uh, so we aim to find 29 drug resistant mutations. We, so we were able to compute two positives, false positive, Recall precision usual uh, uh, metrics like that, and the Condor pipeline with the two components had a quite high uh, precision, with a very few false positives. Um, and we can note also that correlation alone works quite well when we have the phenotype. Um, okay for that. So I don't know. I, I don't have the time. Is it okay? Uh, do, we have, do we have four minutes? Okay. Great. So I will just finish with um, a thing that is most mostly transversal to everything I said before, is that as you have maybe noticed, I, I talked a lot about data analysis workflows uh, for consensus generations, a large workflow to compute all this data, uh, multiple sequence alignment, we have huge workflows to do that, uh, phylogeny inference, also workflows, uh, evolutionary analysis, many workflows. So in the end, uh, the data is nowadays composed not of raw data, but of workflow. Our data are the workflows. And we have many workflows uh, that we develop, that we use, and so on. That's uh, really quite uh, huge. And so when we talk about workflow, a little bit more formally, what we can uh, define is that a workflow is basically, is basically a graph that represents the specification of the analysis that we want to do. The nodes of these graphs uh, are processes by informatics tasks that use tools and so on, operations. And the edges of these graphs are the data flow, co correspond to the data flow between the processes. And um, there are workflow management systems that are widely used nowadays uh, to, to represent this workflow. So Galaxy, for example, Nextflow, SnakeMake, that are quite nice because they are code-based. So we write uh, basically uh, scripts to, to, the, to implement these workflows. And so why is it important to, why, why do I talk about that? Um, it's mainly in the in the area of reproducibility crisis and so on. But for a concrete example, 
you analyze some data, you develop a pipeline, you analyze the data, you refactor the pipeline, you reanalyze, you refactor, and so on. At, at some point, you are happy with your data analysis, you submit a paper. When the reviews come back, you cry because uh, the reviewers ask you many things and you don't remember how the figure was generated and so on. where is the right data. And so, so it's a mess. So here we, come, we talk about computational reproducibility that uh, inform us about the detailed information about the code, the software used, the hardware and implementation details. And mm -hmm. the goal here is to document how the data has been produced and the results has been produced. And workflow helped, uh, helped a lot in this area. And workflows and their ecosystem. It means um, workflows themselves, how we structure the analysis, but also how we manage the environment, the software environment, the tools, the libraries, operating systems, and so on the execution machine, the versioning of all the stuff. And so workflows uh, solve part of all these uh, problematics about reproducibility. Um, we can think about versioning, uh, multi-language analysis, uh, testing the workflows. Now it's more, yeah, it's more, more used now. Uh, sharing the analysis a little bit, uh, how to manage the environment, how to perform parallel processing of all these uh, steps of the workflows to re-execute the processes, to uh, change the executing machines, to handle the errors and so on, and uh, perform scalable executions of many machines. So workflows are, work, work quite well for that. However, now the problematic is that more and more workflows are available in the databases, in the in the repositories. Here, if we look at the number of articles in Nature of Science that mention next one statements, it's quite growing. In principle, it's not it's okay still in 2022, but if we follow the trend, it can be problematic for a few years. Um, and the evolution of the monthly and cumulative number of next and snake make workflows available on GitHub is quite increasing uh, annually. So now the problem is a little bit less on the reproducibility part than the reuse and sharing part. And here, if you look at the pipeline lifecycle that we defined uh, in 2023, um, development of the workflows kind of okay. I mean, we have to, to diffuse the, the, the good practices for that, but we have tools to do that. Uh, testing, deployment, execution, maintenance, reproducibility, quite okay. But now the real problem is the reuse. How can we reuse all this stuff? And uh, so the goal, and uh, that's, that's what uh, George during his PhD with Sarah and I uh, is working on. How can we reuse all this code? How can we annotate this workflow, store this workflow, where is this workflow, and so on. And okay, and just to go back uh, on uh, on viral workflows, just to to mention that all these workflows are really uh, highly used nowadays, and it's more and more, more and more used even in these uh, viral. Analysis, for example, Next Train, which is a, a very widely used system to monitor the the, the, the epidemics, uh, is based on SnakeMake. The data behind are analyzed using Safe SnakeMake, uh, and a lot of viral workflows uh, are using Next Train SnakeMake. So it's these two problematics are kind of correlated. So I would like to thank you for your attention. I, I don't know if I'm late or not, um, and I want really to thank all the collaborators uh, with uh, whom I worked uh, in the past few years. Of course, at LESN, uh, at the National Respiratory, Respiratory Center for National Reference Center for Respiratory Viruses, uh, Museum de National Histoire Naturelle, Paul and Olivier, UTC Compiègne Mirene, uh, Jean Bacal in Kenya, the Jiva Unit at Pasteur, and so on. And uh, of course, our former team at Pasteur, Evolutionary Bioinformatics Team, with uh, Jakub, Luc, Anna, and Marie. Thank you very much.